Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to um, the fourth webinar in our Naturalist Notes webinar series. So glad that you could be here this evening. Um, my name is Susie Fortner and I am the Programs and Operations Director with Friends of the Dunes. My pronouns are she, her. Hi everyone, I'm Daisy Ambris Perez. I'm the Outreach Manager at Friends of the Dunes and my pronouns are she, her. We're really excited for tonight's presentation about pinnipeds, um, but first we have a couple of quick things to go over. Yes, I want to begin by acknowledging that Friends of the Dunes and our staff are working and living on the unceded territory of the Buyat people, which include Buyat Tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Uh, we out people continue to be the working stewards of the lands, waterways, air, plants, and animals of their ancestral homelands, which include the stretch of land between Balut Kasamuli, Little River, to Raski Yuit, Bear River Ridge, since time immemorial. Today, we want to honor our placement within We out territory. We out people and their culture have survived the violent colonization, genocide, and attempted erasure. A large part of any people's culture is their language, and for the Wiat peoples, Saluk Luk is this language. For each webinar, we are introducing a Wiat word of the day, and today's Saluk Luk word is Guayamuli, meaning sea lion. Thanks, Daisy. So in case you aren't already familiar with Friends of the Dunes, um, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving the natural diversity of coastal environments through community supported education and stewardship programs. Um, we also have our home in this beautiful building, the Humboldt Coastal Nature Center, which we are really excited to announce is um, opening up again, starting next week uh, on May 19th, Wednesday for the first time. Um, in over a year since the COVID-19 pandemic started. So we're really excited to open the doors again. We're gonna be starting with a pretty soft opening of just doing a, a few weekdays, Wednesday through Friday, but are looking forward to being open on weekends again. Um, also, I wanted to let everybody know, um, thank you for joining this webinar series and the proceeds from this webinar series are funding scholars, excuse me, scholarships for our fall coastal naturalist training. That's an eight week California naturalist program um, that takes place in September and October. We will be releasing some more details about that training soon. So if you liked this webinar series and you want to learn more about our coastal environments, I encourage you to um, look into that course. Um, and if you don't already receive um, our email updates, that's a good way to stay up to speed on information from Friends of the Dunes. You can sign up on our website or just e email us back at um, the email, which we um, sent your registration and we will get you signed up for those emails. Yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, joining Friends of the Dunes on our very first webinar series. Um, we have two more to go after this one. So it's getting close to the end, but we're really excited for the next two. Um, so I just really wanna go over um, some quick housekeeping items. Um, please feel free to communicate amongst yourselves within the chat. You can toggle who you're sending the message to by clicking on the blue button in your chat box. If you wanna send a message to all of us, please make sure that that um, blue button says um, to, that you're sending the message to attendees and also to the panelists. Um, if you have questions for the presenter, please type them into the Q&A rather than the chat. That will make it much easier for us to find uh, those questions at the end of the presentation. You can also control your view of um, the presentation by clicking on the little right button um, up in your corner. Uh, yeah. And last but not least, these webinars will be recorded and we will send you a link to the video within the next few days. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our presenter, Claire Nazar, a biologist and California Sea Grant Fellow. Awesome, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see things? Things are happening? 
Things are happening. We can see them. Fantastic. Okay. I'm also starting my timer. So we stay on time today. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Daisy and Susie, for the introduction and for inviting me to be a part of this um, amazing uh, series. I'm uh, privileged to be here. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank everyone who's tuning in at home or wherever you are. Um, it's a joy to be here with you today um, and talk about something that I care deeply about. And um, hopefully you can learn something about the creatures that live in your backyard on the North Coast. And so here's a general overview of what I plan to cover today. I'm not going to go over the whole list. Um, but essentially, um, we're going to talk about marine mammals in general and how pinnipeds fall into that group. Then we're going to talk about how pinnipeds thrive at sea. You can't leave this talk without knowing the difference between a seal and a sea lion. So of course, we're going to cover that. And then at the end of this talk, we're going to be discussing species that you can find in your backyard and um, how you can be a good neighbor to them. So um, this is my most narcissistic slide, um, but I do think it's important for me to tell you um, why I believe Susie and Daisy think maybe I'm qualified to talk to you about um, pinnipeds today. Um, so I've worked with seals and sea lions and other marine mammals for about 10 years. I started um, at a kind of a, an interesting point and then where I am now, it's, it, it's developed, but essentially I worked with um, captive animals um, for a while and then I transitioned into doing field work and that field work took me to pretty amazing places um, working with seals and sea lions including the Pribilof Islands in Alaska and the Farallon Islands and if anyone wants to talk about any of those experiences if there's time at the end or if you've been there I'd love to chat with you. Um, I've also been lucky enough to actually complete my thesis at Humboldt State University in your neck of the woods um, and it was about seabirds and pinnipeds and um, essentially how they use space and how people use space on the coast um, and kind of the effects of what that might mean biologically. And I am recently uh, finished up a fellowship with California Sea Grant, which um, was amazing uh, because I really got to take kind of the research I've been working on and really apply it to policy. And so in a little bit of this talk, I'll be weaving in some marine policy for all those types of people as well, if you're interested in that. And currently I'm working at Año Nuevo Reserve or Año Nuevo State Park um, as a field researcher with UC Santa Cruz. Uh, you are not here to talk about me, you're here to learn about marine mammals. Um, so essentially, there are five groups of marine mammals. And before I go over those groups, I think it's really important that all of us kind of rewind back to, is it kindergarten or first grade? Let's say first grade, when we learn about what makes a mammal a mammal, because I think it's really relevant for today's talk, where I'm going to be kind of covering the natural history of pinnipeds. So all mammals have hair and fur, they give birth to live young, they must breathe air, they all drink milk at some point in their lives, and they're all warm blooded. So if you wanna challenge yourself during this talk and think about one of those five things, then just keep that in the back of your head when I'm talking about some of the adaptations that these animals have to survive. Um, I think it'll just kind of blow your mind that they're able to still be a mammal in the ocean. And again, the, the kind of word marine means saltwater. So these are mammals that live in saltwater. Okay. The groups of marine mammals are the cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins, and porpoises, polar bears, which are in the Arctic, so up at the North Pole. There's also sea otters, which are kind of the most recent mammal to adapt its life to a marine existence. The dugongs, manatees, and sirenians, or dugongs, manatees, and extinct stellar sea cow, which are all in the group sirenian, excuse me. And then um, why you're all here, the coolest group of marine mammals, um, the pinnipeds, which are seals, sea lions, and walruses. Um, so let's dive into pinnipeds. Uh, if you want to know what this <laughs> species is, I'll tell you. Um, remember I told you I was working for UC Santa Cruz. I primarily have been working with these creatures. This is a northern elephant seal weanling, 
or if you want to sound silly, you can call it a wiener. So this is a Northern elephant seal wiener. And part of my job at UC Santa Cruz was actually measuring how much these animals weigh and how long they are over a really long-term, essentially, population study that if anyone has questions about too, like how do you weigh a weanling? We literally put that animal on a scale and see how much it weighs. We could talk about that, but this is one of my favorites of all pinnipeds. And before I go too much further, I also uh, put a stop here for myself to remind everyone what the word pinniped yeah. means. So if we break up that word, pinna, the prefix means flipper or wing, and then ped, like pedestrian, means foot. Um, so it's the flipper or fin, because their flippers kind of look like a fin or a feather, footed animals. Okay. So um, admittingly, <laughs> I'm not a paleontologist. So if any of the about 30 participants on this webinar are a paleontologist, is a paleontologist, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna give a very brief explanation of where pinnipeds derived from. Depending on who you are, essentially you might think that seals, sea lions, and walruses share a common ancestor, or you might believe that they have different uh, ancestors. Again, not gonna go into the details. I will tell you that those different schools of thought are generally based on either your strong belief in morphological traits or like mitochondrial DNA. Um, but essentially there's kind of a recent consensus that most pinnipeds, so seals, sea lions and walruses actually did share a common ancestor. And that common ancestor is called Aneliarctos. And it's believed that this animal inhabited the ocean about 20 to 25 million years ago. So my talk today is mostly going to be covering seals and sea lions, because unfortunately, off the California coast, we don't have any walruses. Um, so just so you know, we're not going to be talking about walruses today, even though they're amazing. So the next part of this uh, talk is about how pinnipeds thrive at sea. And I've broken up this next section into essentially four different pieces, starting with locomotion and aquatic propulsion. So seawater is super hard to move through. So pinnipeds are adapted to move through water with very little drag. So their sex organs and their mammary glands are all retracted into their body. And they have really sleek bodies to help them kind of, uh, again, reduce drag and all of their appendages have been modified into flippers. Another important adaptation that pinnipeds have to survive and thrive in the ocean is their ability to thermoregulate. So water is really hard to move through and it's also super duper cold. Water absorbs heat from the body of a mammal about 25 times more rapidly than air does. And so to stay warm, pinnipeds have blubber or sometimes they have blubber and fur, or sometimes they have just a bunch of fur. So blubber is kind of like fat, except it's vascularized. And there's some other differences about blubber too, um, but essentially it's like a thick layer of fat that helps them stay warm. And then occasionally, especially in the true seals, um, pups are born with a special coat called a lanugo, as you can see in this video. And the lanugo can serve uh, dual purposes sometimes. Like with this harp seal, it's helping that pup stay warm, but it's also helping it blend in with the ice. Remember that really big uh, northern elephant seal weanling I showed you? Remember its lanugo was black. So lanugos can be different colors too. Sometimes uh, pinnipeds get too hot. <laughs> And so uh, some species like the Northern elephant seal on the left hand of the screen and the Southern elephant seal on the right hand of the screen will actually flip sand on their bodies to stay cool. Um, maybe some of you have been to an area where you can find a lot of sea lions and you'll see sea lions, or if you're really lucky, fur seals, um, actually stick their flippers out of the water. Um, and those are called, they can be used as a thermal, thermal window to either dump heat if they're too hot or absorb heat if they're um, cold. Another important adaptation that all pinnipeds have is that they molt their fur. And they do this in different ways. Sometimes they molt, which is just kind of like shedding fur like a dog or a cat would. That's what California sea lions do and harbor seals. Um, but some pinnipeds 
actually go through something called a catastrophic molt, which is a perfect name for what happens. If you look at that northern elephant seal on the right side of the screen, they actually lose chunks of skin and fur at, um, in just big patches. I was just at Año Nuevo last week and the beaches were littered with literally patches of um, fur on the sand. One of the most special adaptations about um, marine mammals and generally, in general, but definitely um, pinnipeds is that they are incredible divers. And so remember, rewind again, that these animals must come to the surface to breathe air, um, but they also have to migrate and dive really deep to find their food. And they must be able to take in adequate amounts of oxygen while swimming and diving for that food. Um, so I listed some of their adaptations here, um, one of which is that they can actually slow their heart rate down. That's called bradycardia. And elephant seals in particular are very well known for this. I read a paper um, in preparation for this talk because I couldn't remember the exact number, but there's a paper from 1997 that um, measured heart rates of elephant seals. And when they're diving, it ranges from like 20 beats per minute to 60 beats per minute. But there was one elephant seal that only had three beats per minute in extreme cases of diving, which is crazy. And they also have the ability to collapse their lungs. And so if you ever have the opportunity to do a necropsy on an elephant seal, or um, many pinnipeds for that matter, where you kind of look at the deceased animal and cut them open and see how they died, take samples, You'll notice that on their ribs, they have really cool um, like joints that are made of cartilage. Um, so that helps them collapse their lungs when they're at pressure because these animals can dive a mile underwater. So you can imagine that with that pressure, their lungs kind of absorb that pressure and they can collapse. And if you have an opportunity to see an elephant seal in the wild, you'll also notice they have really special snot that I didn't put on the slide, but it's important to mention. The special snot is called surfactant and it's white and it looks foamy. And if you ever touch it, maybe don't do that unless I'm with you and I find surfactant for you or you're with another biologist, but it's like super, super slimy. We actually have surfactant when we're born, when we're babies and surfactant acts as lubrication for the lungs. So that's just a few amazing adaptations that um, pinnipeds have uh, to essentially dive. Pretty cool. Okay, now this slide, as some of the people on the call know, I have some friends on this call, on um, this um, video webinar, they know I could talk about sensory systems for hours, but I'm gonna try to do it in two minutes. <laughs> so essentially, pinnipeds have incredible sensory systems. So let's start with hearing. Sound waves travel really well in water. And the speed of sound is increased about five times in water. We probably all know that even low frequency sounds can travel hundreds of miles in the ocean. So their ability to hear both in and out of water is very, very good. Okay, let's move on to their chemoreceptive sensibility or sensitivity. So that's their sense of smell. Their sense of smell, we're still learning about. There was a paper published just a month ago about um, the ability for otoriads or sea lions to smell. And we don't think it's very, very good, but it's definitely good enough for moms and pups to identify one another. And we're still learning a lot about their sense of smell. Um, they have a sense of touch through their whiskers or their vibrissae. And they also have really good vision. They have a really good, um, well-developed tapetum lucidum, which um, cats have too. It essentially just helps them absorb light. And something that's really interesting about pinniped eyeballs is that they can see very clearly above and below the surface of the water because their cornea and the water around them have the same refractive index. And it's also very, very rounded like a fisheye lens. And so if you were to open your eyes underwater, you know how it's kind of blurry? For a pinniped, it's like they're wearing goggles essentially. The, it's not blurry for them underwater, which makes a lot of sense. So you might be wondering what these two videos at the bottom of the slide are representing. So this is a lab that I was talking about that I worked in at UC Santa Cruz. This lab is called the Pinniped Cognition and Sensory Systems Lab. 
So the principal investigator at this lab, Dr. Reichmuth, is really interested in how pinnipeds essentially get information from the environment and how they think about it, and also how they sense things in their environment. And her and her graduate students have found really amazing things specifically that I'm going to talk about now about their hearing. So in their ability to essentially hear sounds underwater and in air. Those two videos on the bottom, the left is a spotted seal and the right is a bearded seal. You can see why that bearded seal has that perfect name. They have the really long vibrissae. Both of those animals are participating in a experiment. And that experiment is essentially asking the seals, what can you hear? And just how we would take a hearing test in school or wherever you take a hearing test, you essentially make a really quiet environment and someone plays you a tone. And that tone or that noise can either um, increase or decrease in frequency. So how high the pitch is or how low the pitch is. And then it can also change in source level. Um, so how loud the sound is or how quiet the sound is. So essentially we ask these seals to participate in this research and through their participation and if they hear the the tone essentially they put their nose to a paddle and if they don't hear anything they just keep their sweet little noses on that chin station we can um through other steps as well that i can talk about if anyone has questions you can essentially get an audiogram which essentially tells you the hearing thresholds of these seals which is really important especially in ice seals that live in the arctic where there's lots of noisy things happening in the ocean um, if anyone has questions about acoustics or how we ask these animals to participate in this sort of research, um, add your questions to the chat box. The most important part of our evening is about to happen. The difference between a seal and a sea lion. Okay, so first of all, there's two, there's three groups of pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, walruses. Again, we're forgetting the walruses focusing on seals and sea lions. Seals, the scientific kind of name for the group of seals is phocids, and the scientific group of sea lions is called otoriads. So I might interchange those words, be ready for it. Okay, so phocids do not have ear flaps, but otoriads have ear flaps. That's the first difference that you can see in these two pictures. One way that you can remember it is that seals' ears are sealed up. I sort of hate that way to remember it because it's not true. There's a literal hole, nothing is sealed up, but there's not a flap. So maybe that can help you remember. The next difference between these two animals is how they move on land. So seals, the image on the left, um, can't really move very well on land. <laughs> they actually inch or move like an inchworm. It's called undulating and they move on their belly. California sea lions or sea lions in general, the otoriads, I'm looking at a California sea lion. <laughs> um, they can actually rotate their back uh, flippers under their hips and walk um, like a dog or whatever other terrestrial animal you're thinking of. Their bellies actually rarely touch the ground when they're walking like that. Another difference between the two groups is that phocids use their back flippers for propulsion in the water and otoriads use their front flippers for propulsion in the water. So here's some fun videos illustrating the differences. So here is a, I believe, Pacific Harbor seal. He's showing off that he has no ear flaps, he has ear holes, and he's undulating on the ground. <laughs> Compared to this uh, terrifying sea lion, I think it's a South American sea lion. Um, see how he's rotated his back flippers under his body and is running very quickly. Okay, remember we said how they move underwater is different. So this is a harbor, oh, excuse me, this is a Waddell seal. How embarrassing for me. This is a Waddell seal in the Antarctic using its back flippers for propulsion underwater. And these are Galapagos sea lions using their front flippers for propulsion. Okay, these next few slides are about species, especially if you live on the North Coast. Essentially, almost anywhere in California, you might see these species, but definitely for my, my friends in Humboldt County, I promise you, you can find these animals in your backyard. So um, Miss Susie and Daisy 
I should have tested this. I am going to attempt to play a Harbor Seal vocalization. And if it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, but this is a Pacific Harbor Seal pup and what they sound like. I'm very pessimistic that this will work. It's very loud in my headphones. I doubt that you heard that. We cannot <laughs> hear anything, unfortunately. Okay, imagine um, just, um, I, I, you know, by training, I am an acoustician. That's not a word, acoustician. Um, so I will imitate it for every all 30 people. It essentially sounds like meh, meh. Um, that's a harbor seal pup. You might be hearing them now. That's why I wanted to play it for you because uh, harbor seals in your area are popping, which is really exciting. So harbor seals, you can find them um, from Mexico to Alaska. Um, they're definitely coastal um, pinnipeds. So these animals like aren't out in the pelagic ocean. They're very near shore species. And they eat a lot of different types of prey, everything from octopus to flatfish. This slide is just showing you some examples of what you might see in the field outside. Um, so essentially harbor seals are black with white spots or white with black spots. Sometimes their spots are hard to see. There's a lot of variation, um, especially for folks in Humboldt County. If you um, head towards like Trinidad in Trinidad Bay, you can see a lot of harbor seals. If I could see your faces, I would say, who's seen a harbor seal in Trinidad? And guaranteed a lot of participants on this call have seen them. One thing I wanted to note is that harbor seals are particularly sensitive to disturbance. And so if you do see a harbor seal while you're kayaking or bird watching or walking on the beach, it's really, really important to give them distance. All pinnipeds, as a matter of fact, it's important to give them distance, which we'll talk about at the end of this, um, at the end of this discussion. So next, another species that you can find um, all, all over California, definitely in Humboldt County, is the California sea lion. One really fun fact about California sea lions is that when males reach sexual maturity, they get this little bump on their head called a sagittal crest. In the next slide, you'll see a really good um, example of that. And remember we talked about their sense of smell? Um, it's true that in odoriads, especially in animals like California sea lions and fur seals, um, we think that moms can recognize their pups by sense of smell. It's one of the first things that you'll see when you're in the field observing these animals is that the mom will come back from the ocean, look for her pup, vocalize. There'll be an orchestra of little pups calling back and somehow she's able to identify it acoustically, but also by probably sense of um, smell, which makes sense. Right. If you look at this um, video that I've included on the slide, uh, these types of um, odoriads are very gregarious and there's a lot of animals at a certain site. So having that adaptation to be able to find each other is super important. Here's some photos of some beautiful California sea lions. I actually sort of hate the, the photo on the left because I think the photographer was probably disturbing this animal, um, but you can really see that sagittal crest, which is what I wanted to show you. You can see those external ear flaps, perfect example of an odoriad. Okay, California, uh, stellar sea lions. Stellar sea lions are amazing. And it is so special that many of you on um, this webinar are able to see them probably 10 miles from your home. Um, you can find stellar sea lions in Trinidad and in Oregon. Um, but I highly recommend you go look for them. They are huge and amazing. And one way that you can tell them apart from California sea lions is their, um, how they sound. So essentially stellar sea lions have this amazing roar. Once again, here I go. I'm going to make a stellar sea lion impression. <laughs> it's a wah, like it's a big wah, roar versus a California sea lion. If you go to Trinidad and you just use your power of listening, you'll hear ar, ar, ar. those are California sea lions, they bark. So before even seeing them, you should be able to tell the difference um, between the two. Something really um, interesting, remember I told you I'd talk about policy, um, is the way that um, stellar sea lions, one way <laughs> that they're being managed. So um, Alaska natives have a really long history of self-regulation 
And there is a really important need to ensure the sustainable take of marine mammals for food, so sustenance, and also um, handicrafts. So co-management um, essentially promotes this really equal participation uh, by Alaska Natives in decisions affecting subsistence harvesting and management of marine mammals. I didn't mention this yet, but all marine mammals are covered with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And so all of this kind of um, uh, co-management with indigenous peoples is, is done together and also within the extent of the law. Um, and something I wanted to actually share with you all today that I have that I wish you were here to um, really see in person is this is actually a pelt. Um, so another species that's still harvested, um, I told you lived on the Pribilof Islands, is a northern fur seal. So this is a northern fur seal, um, subadult male, um, that was harvested um, a couple months be before I went on island and it was eaten um, and it was turned into art and then um, given to me and my partner. Um, so there's really cool art on the back. Um, and again, this is this is this really cool example of this co-management um, between essentially the federal government um, and uh, the Aleut tribe out on, I was on St. George. Um, if anyone has questions about that, I'm very happy to share my experience. So finally, this is kind of uh, the sad part of the slide about stellar sea lions is that they're not doing super good. And let me make a very deliberate point um, that this last bullet point is unrelated to the second bullet point, okay? Essentially, in 1997, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA Fisheries recognized that stellar sea lions, even though they're kind of one species, fundamentally, the way that they should be managed are in two distinct population segments. There's the Western stock and the Eastern stock. I know it's confusing because we live on the West Coast, most of us. Our stellar sea lion population is the Eastern stock and the Western stock are the stellar sea lions that live in the Aleutian Islands out to Russia. So essentially the Eastern stock has since recovered and it's, it's been delisted, but the Western stock of stellar sea lions do it real bad. Um, they're still endangered. And the reasons um, that this is happening are multiple PhD dissertations and master's students um, are working and PIs are working on answering this question. So I'll just highlight a couple of things why we think this is happening. Um, one of which of course is contentious, but it, it is, I'm gonna say it, that it's likely um, the effects of fisheries. So essentially cumulative and annual commercial fishery removals of the species prey type is probably um, affecting the kind of the distribution and abundance of these species. Other things like climate change and sea level rise, um, you know, disease, toxic accumulation in their bodies, vessel strikes, disturbance, and entanglement of fishing gear are other reasons that are probably affecting the species. All the more reason <laughs> that you should go out and try to find a stellar sea lion and observe it from a distance because they're really, really cool. Here is a picture of a California sea lion and a stellar and um, it's a perfect example of this kind of see the differences between the two. Remember I said to pay attention to that nose. California sea lions have a little bit of a, a little bit of a pointier longer no nose and stellar sea lions, I described to people, they look more like a bear and it's a little bit more like, just like blunt and yeah, stocky. So finally, the last species I'm gonna tell you about that you can see in your backyard are the Northern elephant seals. Um, I'm very biased. This is my favorite spe species, um, but I only have about six more minutes left in my talk, so I can't talk too long about it. Elephant seals are amazing. They're essentially the species of really incredible extremes. They, they're huge, they travel far, um, they fast for a long time. And um, let's start with that first thing, that they can travel up to 14,000 miles in a single year and that they can dive up to a mile underwater. The males weigh two and a half tons. And something that I've been really dedicated into helping support as a field researcher is to understanding their social structure. Um, so essentially males have this incredible ability to have these giant harems of up to 200 females that they have single uh, breeding rights to. 
um, and establishing who's alpha and who's beta and you know who gets those breeding rights are so interesting. If anyone has questions at the end of this talk, let's talk about elephant seal dominance hierarchies because it's amazing. Um, spoiler alert, a lot of those hierarchies are actually determined um, and enforced and reinforced uh, by acoustics, which is really cool. So I've had the opportunity to work with northern elephant seals at actually five sites, but three primarily have been on Unuevo, um, the Farallon Islands, and the Lost Coast. One way that we study these animals, ooh, I practice this. Look how fancy I am. Check this out, I'm gonna add a laser pointer. What? Hopefully you can see that. Um, so uh, essentially these animals, when they're weanlings, I showed you the picture in the beginning of the presentation, we deploy these green little flipper tags. You can imagine that these green flipper tags are very tiny and very hard to see. <laughs> So every year it's my job and about 10 other people's job to get some black hair dye and write whatever is on their flipper tag on the side of their body. So we can tell who they are throughout the year and we don't have to get close to them for the remainder of the season to know who's who and um, track them over time. Eventually they do molt that off. Um, and so uh, we have to go back every year and add that hair dye. If you look really closely, you can actually see that this is peak breeding season. These two males are fighting for dominance in this harem at Año Nuevo Point. You can see that black hair dye right there. So because we were able to add that after this fight, I didn't have to get close to that 5,000 pound animal. I could just see it from a distance and say who won that fight. Okay, so something I wanted to share with you too is because you have elephant seals in your backyard, I'm going to tell you where in just a second, I want to remind you that if you're at an elephant seal colony, a common question I get is when are the elephant seals here? Because there's a lot of seasonality in wildlife on the north coast just in general, right? You have some birds that migrate in and out. You have plants that are flowering and not flowering. But for elephant seals, they're actually there essentially the whole year, but um, but it depends on what time of year, what animals are doing. Animals are doing things at different time of year. That was a better way of saying that. So in the breeding season, for instance, it's um, essentially December through March. And in the springtime, there's pups there. Um, in the, after they are ready to go, they leave and then the males come and molt. There's that catastrophic molt. That's what I'm studying right now on Nuevo. I'm writing down the molt status of hundreds of animals. Then they leave. And then in the fall, the two and three-year-olds come and just rest. And then that cycle starts all over again. So you have an elephant seal colony um, at the Lost Coast at the King Range National Conservation Area by the um, Punta Gorda Lighthouse. I highly recommend that everyone goes and checks out these seals from a distance. It's amazing. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, these animals are actually encroaching on a public use trail. So this sets up, again, my policy brain is just gets so fired up about this because as I told you, these animals are federally, federally protected, but they're also potentially interacting with a Wilderness Protection Act, which is another federal law. But you see that lighthouse in the back, um, that lighthouse is protected under the National, oh, Historical Preservation Act. So there's three national federal laws that are like maybe conflicting with one another. Maybe there's a way to have them work together, um, but it's a really interesting scenario. So go to the Lost Coast, check out these animals again from a distance. Don't let your dogs near them. Um, don't go close to them, but you can get a really good view. And if you see any blue tags, um, those animals were actually tagged at Punta Gorda at that site. If you see any pink tags, they're from either the Fairlawns or Point Reyes National Seashore. And if you see any green tags, um, they're from Año Nuevo. Almost done here. Oh yeah, these slides will make you probably really frustrated like they did for me in preparation for this talk. Um, one of the best ways we can protect um, pinnipeds is by giving them space. All of these photos were taken by my friend Nick who often is at La Jolla in San Diego and he said, I said, hey Nick, can you send me some photos of people interacting with marine mammals when they maybe shouldn't be? And he said, I have so many photos. Um, 
this is one of the worst things people can people can do with marine mammals and it's one of the best ways you can help actually is if you ever see anyone kind of approaching marine mammals or maybe doing things they shouldn't um, you can call your local wild um, wildlife enforcement officer or just a general law enforcement officer you can always call caltip of course if you feel safe i can't like promote this but if you do feel safe and it's a friend or someone you know or um, you have other people with you and you feel like you can educate i think that's the best way to go and um, because essentially disturbance and harassment is super illegal <laughs> but also can affect the fitness of these animals um, over, a long, over a long time frame. These animals need to molt, right? They need to thermoregulate and they need to essentially rest on land. It's really important. And so hopefully you have a little bit more tools to maybe educate some of your friends or uh, maybe you've learned now. Um, another thing you can do is if you see any live animals that seem distressed, like entangled in gear or look emaciated or look kind of funky, um, I included the North Coast Marine Mammal Center phone number on this slide. You can snap a picture of the slide. Um, and then if you see any dead marine mammals, um, there's a number and a website that you can report um, dead marine mammals to through Humboldt State University. Um, so with that, I want to acknowledge and thank Daisy and Susie and all of the Friends of the Dunes support system um, for having me and inviting me and allowing me to talk about something I'm clearly super passionate about. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for being on this um, webinar and, you know, wanting to learn more. It's so important. And I really challenge each and every one of you to share one thing um, that you learned from today with someone that you care about, someone that you love, or um, yeah, maybe a coworker. And um, I left my contact information there and I love following up with people after these calls. And so if anyone wants to reach out, I, I couldn't encourage you more to jot down my email and, and reach out with any questions that you have. Um, thank you so much. And I'm excited to see if there's any questions um, for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. So much great information about pinnipeds. Um, and yeah, just a reminder to folks, if you have some questions for Claire, please type them into the Q&A. Um, I'm over here like jotting down notes like crazy and I have a few questions myself in case we don't get more in the Q&A. Um, <laughs> and I actually went to UC Santa Cruz too and studied marine biology um, <laughs> and then came to Humboldt for masters. So we've been on like a similar path, but um, it's been a long time. So I kind of forgot all those fun facts about um, the different types of, uh, pinnipeds and how to tell the difference between them. Um, and also, I just want to comment that your vocalizations were just amazing. You're a professional acoustologist or whatever that word was that you made up. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple. Oh, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen, Claire, so that people can see us here. Thank you. And um, yeah, we've got some questions coming up in the Q&A. Oh, I did want to add a real quick um, thing about the way that they move seals versus sea lions, because I um, have done a lot of marine science summer camps and marine science education with young kids in my day. And one of the best descriptions I heard from another educator about how to tell the difference by the way they move is um, Sea lions can balance a ball on their nose and seals are sausages with flippers. I love <laughs> it. That was hilarious and a great description. <laughs> okay, we do have some great questions come up here. So we're gonna kind of switch back and forth between me and Daisy. Um, I'll start, we've got a question from L'Oreal, our lichen expert from last week. Um, Great talk, I'm taking notes. Please tell me more about how you can ask the seals to participate in the sound study and what is your favorite finding from these studies? Oh my gosh, the best question of all time. Um, yeah, so how do we get the seals to participate in that study? I think I'm gonna zoom out and, um, and say, how do we get any animal to participate in anything um, cooperatively um, and respectfully? And essentially in the facilities I've worked at, which are the Pinniped Cognition and Sensory Systems Lab and the Vancouver Aquarium, where I was an intern and a trainer. Um, essentially, we don't force the animals to do anything. All is done through positive reinforcement. 
And so um, essentially through anything, just like a husbandry behavior, like asking for their flipper or asking them to open their mouth or asking them to roll over so you can see their belly or do an ultrasound, all is done through uh, trust and a lot of fish is really helpful. Um, and also really, really good um, positive reinforcement and really high quality trainers. There were some animals um, that I worked next door to with some dolphins that participate in physiology studies that don't even need to be fed to participate in this work. They can go um, multiple hours with just working with their trainers and they actually really en enjoy it. Um, so I'm sure there's maybe some people on the call who um, you maybe think that my description of that is a little bit subjective, um, but definitely, um, you know, I worked, I worked in captive facilities for three years and um, it's done through a lot of trust and really, really good positive reinforcement. Um, there's actually some trainers on this call right now that could speak at length of, of how that's done. More logistically, um, essentially when those animals were pups, when they were really, really young, we trained them to really love the sound of a tone. And so, and also train them um, to essentially put, put their nose to a target or that like white paddle. Um, and so through essentially training them to respond to a tone by pushing their paddle and giving them a fish, it doesn't take that long. There was a seal that we worked with um, who, Tunu, for people listening, he, he learned how to do that in like less than a week. It doesn't take them very long at all. They're really, really smart. And then my favorite finding, gosh, there's been so many. I think, I think one of, this is kind of a weird way to answer this question, but one of my favorite findings is how we can adapt captive studies to help us understand systems in the field. Um, and so, what I mean by that is I was involved in a playback study with Northern elephant seals and without getting too much in the weeds here, we essentially recorded males vocalizing um, and we would play those tones back to other male elephant seals. So we would capture a male's acoustic call who sounds really big and scary and play it to a subordinate male out in Anya Nuevo. And we would very often find that that seal would actually retreat away from the speaker. Again, reinforcing that notion and that what we know now that acoustic cues are sometimes more important than even fighting. However, when we were setting up that, um, that experiment outside, we wouldn't have known if our speaker would have been able to play a tone or play that essentially that playback of the elephant seal if we didn't have captive studies understanding the audiogram. So we actually had a trained Northern elephant seal, Bernice, rest in peace, this amazing Northern elephant seal female um, who was unreleasable and she stayed with the pinniped lab for like 16 years. And through work with her, we knew what elephant seals could hear. And we applied that to actually our field research outside. So it's a, that's, I hope that kind of answers the question that um, there's definitely interesting results that I've been helped be a part of for the past 10 years. But I think kind of zooming out even more, I really appreciate how captive studies can really help us do things in the field. Because there's things that you cannot do in the field that you can do in captivity. And there's some things that you absolutely cannot do in captivity that we can um, uh, observe in the field. So I think, I think that duality is really cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Mike Sipra asks, Claire, you're awesome. You're. <laughs> um, what are policy positions that local fo folks or organizations could adapt or sign on to um, to support pinnipeds? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, so local, I think it's hard for me to answer because right now I'm in Monterey. Um, most of folks who are probably tuning in are in Humboldt County. Um, if you have the if you have the means um, and the ability and the willingness, I I would say you know donate money to um, the North Coast Marine Mammal Center if if you if that interests you and you care about that. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, volunteering too is a really good way to spend your time. And there might be some folks who volunteer for Friends of the Dunes on this call, maybe for the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust, um, or even the Marine Mammal Center. Or if there's students on the call. Um, one thing that you can do to help is, um, and also kind of do some own self-reflection on what you want to help with in the future, is to volunteer with graduate students um, or principal investigators on campus. So I know that's a little bit of a fluffy answer, but I think, I think that locally it really depends on what you want to spend money on or what you want to spend your time on, um, because that, that will differ person to person. And it's hard for me, um, yeah, it's hard for me to answer the question because I, 
I also don't want to reveal kind of my own what I think money should go to and time should go to because that's not fair because I have my own experiences. But um, yeah, locally, Friends of the Dunes is pretty cool. And also the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust is really cool. So volunteering or donating money to either of those organizations or the Marine Mammal Center in the North Coast, they, they're a small facility. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for that plug, Claire. <laughs> uh, of course, I mean it. Um, I would just add to that, just because I do, I um, am originally from San Diego and I visit La Jolla every time I go down there. Um, the, another way that you can support pinnipeds is really just like respecting their space, as Claire said multiple times throughout her presentation, because I've witnessed those folks at La Jolla and it drives me crazy every time seeing that. Um, and I think, you know, there are also pinnipeds, they might not be, it, our beaches might not be as populated or as easily accessible as some of those beaches in San Diego, um, but there are still people out there with dogs off leash. Um, so just give, give the animals some space, especially this time of year with the pups out on the beaches. Um, a lot of times those harbor seal pups will be on the beach while their moms are out hunting. Um, so <coughs> space, um, put your dog on a leash <laughs> if you're out there with your dog, um, yeah. Just want to just emphasize that message. My dog was just agreeing with you. I, I think she somehow <laughs> heard you through <laughs> my headphones. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a question here from um, Sarah McKay Strobel. Um, can you tell us more about the dominance hierarchy of northern elephant seals? Yeah, so that's Dr. Strobel, and actually, she's incredible. She studied the sensitivity. She worked at the Pinniped Lab, and she. I hope people are listening. This is so rad. She studied a lot of things, but one thing that I love that Sarah studied was the sensitivity of sea otter paws. So literally you can Google her and find some of her publications, but Sarah is amazing. Um, and yeah, dominance. I, I, so this was someone's PhD thesis. So I can't really get into all the nitty gritty about dominance hierarchies of Northern elephant seals, but something um, that I think is fascinating and that I'd like to reiterate um, and for anyone who's into biology on the call and knows a little bit about fitness and, and you know, kind of trade-offs in evolution and ecology is this really, I think, fascinating thing that a lot of communication with elephant seals actually isn't done through physical interaction with one another. Um, you know, if you see, if you Google photos of elephant seals, they're always constantly fighting. I showed two pictures of like bloody fights with elephant seals. But ultimately, those dominance hierarchies are sometimes done through fighting, but oftentimes just done through acoustics. And that makes sense, right? Um, because, sorry, I got distracted by that comment. It's Sarah McKay Strobel. <laughs> I'll type it in the chat. Um, so yeah, a lot of those dominance hierarchies are just resolved acoustically, which makes sense because it's very expensive to fight. And you can find that in other, um, you know, uh, taxes, like even with carnivores, right? With, um, well, I guess pinnipeds are carnivores, but I'm trying to think of like a lion, like they often don't fight to the death, you know? And I, I just think that's really interesting that a lot of hierarchies are actually done through through acoustics and they're actually not fighting all the time. And that makes sense, you know, they're, when they're out on land, I didn't even tell you all this, but they're not eating the whole time. The males sometimes are fasting for over three months. They're not drinking water. They're not eating. I'll let that sit in. They're not eating for three to three and a half months. They lose, you know, 40 to 50% of their body mass. And so to go start a fight with some beta male is kind of a waste of energy. And so I like to think about that a lot. And I think that's really interesting. Oh, thank you. That's incredible. I did not know that. <laughs> They're so cool. Yeah. Okay, so Don Williams asks, uh, what is the most common pinniped in Humboldt Bay? I'm so, so tempted to look at, I have, I have my like thesis folder on my desktop. So part of my thesis is actually looking at the seasonality of pinnipeds and seabirds, you know, in Trinidad um, and where they use space. Um, and I think I would say California sea lions are probably the most abundant. I, that's, that's, that's where I'm putting my money. Yeah. California sea lions are the most abundant and they come in like thousands. There was one day that I counted 1300 sea lions just around Trinidad. So that's like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So many. <laughs> that's amazing. You can see the most of them, um, in, uh, Patrick's point. Yeah. Palmer, Palmer point, right. Is not a, yeah, that's a place that was one of my sites. 
yeah, <laughs> definitely a place. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I really appreciated your vocalizations, I want to add, because I've always been wondering, like, how do I tell the difference between the stellar sea lion and um, the California sea lion, because I knew they were both up here. Um, and sometimes they're so far off that it is really hard to tell through binoculars, like when they're out on those islands in Trinidad, it's hard to get like a really good look at them. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing that you can just tell the difference. You if you can't tell, I really, really like acoustics. It's really interesting. Nice. Okay, so next question. Um, do cetaceans have fur or hair? Oh, good question. Yeah. So um, uh, especially when, um, like, let's talk about dolphins for a second, even though that they're not as cool as pinnipeds, we'll talk about them. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. They're not as cool. Um, but when, pinna when cetaceans are born on their rostrum, they actually have like tiny, they look like little whiskers. And for dolphins, those um, actually like go away after they're born. But then animals like a humpback whale and baleen whale, a different type of cetacean, um, they have bumps on their body and like on their rostrum mostly. And those bumps are called tubercles. And it's kind of weird, but on each tubercle, there's sometimes, I think maybe always a single hair. And there are some, there's some research you can Google. Um, and I think they might actually help, they think maybe with sensory systems, like almost like whiskers, but I can't, I can't talk to that at length. Um, but yes, that counts as hair. So yes, cetaceans do have hair. Um, thank you for bringing that up, but it's usually on their rostrum and with many species, it, it goes, it goes away. Um, yeah, you should Google uh, tubercle hair. It's pretty weird. <laughs> Definitely have to Google that. <laughs> Um, another question from L'Oreal. Um, please talk more about your experience working at St. and uh, she forgot the name. Uh, yeah. Island in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, so St. George Island mm -hmm. is one of two islands, which is a part of the Pribilof Islands. Um, yeah, I can, yeah, this, that experience was transformative for me as um, a human being um, and as a researcher. Um, so I went out as a volunteer, a very low, low paid volunteer, but it was amazing with NOAA. And I lived and worked on the island for about three months during the Northern fur seal breeding season. And it was me and two other people. And we lived on an island with about 30 um, tribal members. Um, and it was amazing. I, I'm still friends with a few people on the island. Um, and even just recanting it right now, um, I'm thinking about the fur seals and the amazing research that we did, which involved looking literally for flipper tags. This is a Northern fur seal flipper tag. See, it's a little bit differently shaped than the other ones. They're a little bit bigger and they go in the four flippers instead of the back flippers. And so kind of fundamentally, my job as a technician was to look for those flippers and do something called recites, which if there's any, you know, population ecologists on the, on the call, you know that through those kinds of mark recapture studies, you can estimate population size and you can ask really interesting questions about how populations will do in the future. And so I was, I was contributing to that kind of research. Um, we were also weighing pups, just how I weighed Northern elephant seal pups this year. So that was another, so all kind of demography and research and kind of helping with long-term monitoring. So that was amazing. But there was this other really special part that was kind of the transformative part, um, which I was, you know, in my mid twenties and most of my, research experience had been in a university and like or at a like very rigorous aquarium it was like very serious um and it was so amazing um just from i can only speak from my own experience but it was really amazing getting to know the community there and being welcomed like in such a profound kind way in the community we babysat for a lot of the kiddos they would come over for dinner we would go over for dinner it's just like this really beautiful experience of being a part of um, a community that uses um, the seals I've been studying um, for in a very different way and being able to like eat eat fur seal and being invited to do that like that was really cool um, getting gifts um, was really cool and so there's this other really neat experience working working up there that had like nothing really to do with science um, so that's a, that's a little bit about my experience if I start talking about it too long I, I get this I just it was a really good experience that's all I'll say about that yeah it's cool nice that sounds amazing yeah it's special <laughs> um I actually had one more question that I was just really curious about personally um, yeah. You so you described um, marking the elephant seals with hair dye. 
I'm just really curious, like, how do you approach that job? Do you just like wait till they're fast asleep or it's like off on it? It just seems like a really kind of sketchy job to do. So I'm very curious about your techniques. <laughs> yeah, I would say there's two methods. Um, with the big males, they are super duper sleepy and starving. And so they really, when they're hauled out, unless they're like actively copulating or vocalizing or in the rare case fighting, um, they're really, really tired. And so with the males, which is that photo I shared, you can really, if you're careful and respectful and quiet, you can go up and just like write numbers on the side of them. Females, way different story. They are super aggressive, super angry. They have pups. They could move really quickly. Their teeth are this big. And that's a whole other ballpark game. I don't watch sports. Essentially, what we do with the females is that we have a piece of wood. I'm going to pretend my phone is a piece of wood. Um, oh, that's weird. I can see my reflection. So there's a piece of wood with a stick on the end of it. It looks like just a broom, like a kind of like a broomstick, but with a piece of wood, like a Swiffer, like a Swiffer. And we write the numbers backwards with the hair dye and we go up to the females and gently kind of uh, stamp them. We call it stamping with the hair dye. Same with their pups. But with the pups, remember they had a black lanugo. So we actually use blonde hair dye with the pups, which is like really silly. Um, and the moms and the pups marks um, sometimes match so we know who's who. Um, and then when I worked on the fair lawns, it was a completely different, it was still stamping, but we actually had sponges that we would cut out in numbers and like dip the sponges that had Velcro on one side and that piece of wood actually had like one side of Velcro and the sponges had the other side and we would stamp them that way. Um, so it depends where you work and it depends on the sex and age that you're marking. But yes, you have to be very sneaky. <laughs> Nice. Thank you. That's like kind of the opposite of what I was thinking. Like I was thinking the males were the scary ones because they're so big um, and they fight, but interesting that the females are the, the more challenging ones to Yeah. To and they're allowed to be angry. You know, they're, they're going through Obviously. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Claire. That wraps up all of our questions. Um, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. We had about 30 people here live on the call, but we also had another, um, I think around 35 registered that are planning to watch it later. So we have been recording this. We're gonna send out that recording in the next couple of days. Um, and we'll include you on that email in case you wanna share that with anybody. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for being here um, and for your support of Friends of the Dunes. And we hope to see you next week when we'll be talking about um, the Bees of the Dunes with Brian Dykstra. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Good night.